Vandana, we can't hear. I think Satya is waiting to start. He's just getting the streaming okay. on the YouTube started. Okay. Okay. Uh, so good evening, everyone. It's uh, very, very nice uh, to see many of you, many of the senior colleagues, uh, especially in the nuclear physics, uh, joining uh, this talk, as Vandana also mentioned, that we have quite a large number also on the YouTube. Uh, to those of you, um, a bit of, you know, uh, not familiar with this particular forum in which all these uh, lectures are being held for many years. Um, ASSET, of course, stands for Advances in Science, Engineering and Technology. This is a field, uh, a kind of a, a forum uh, that complements the colloquia that happens, uh, weekly colloquia that happens every Wednesday and Thursday. Wednesday, of course, at TIFR, we have uh, what we call natural sciences uh, faculty colloquium, which used to be, in fact, only physics colloquium earlier when Baba started. And then on Thursday, we have mathematics colloquium. On Fridays, we have this, which, as I said, complements uh, the, the other two in terms of discussing uh, largely uh, instrumentation detectors, computers, um, software, and many other engineering and technology centric um, uh, topics. But also, uh, ASSET has a, a kind of a freedom in some way to kind of also uh, bring up uh, talks on medical technology, talk about history of science, and many talks like what uh, you are going to listen even today. And uh, as I mentioned possibly before, the ASSET has been quite an old colloquium series, started way back in 1983. And uh, this year, we are celebrating 40 years of uh, uh, the asset colloquium and hence some of these talks that you hear are in, in, in way a celebration of this particular milestone for asset. And it's indeed great pleasure to once again welcome uh, Dr. Amit Rai, of course, who is known to all of us for many, many years, uh, who is going to kind of uh, give uh, today's colloquium, but is also somewhat special because uh, this is the joint uh, uh, Pavinari asset colloquium about which um, I think Vandana will say a few more words, formally inviting today's speaker uh, ahead of. Thank you very much, all of you, and thanks for joining. And over to Vandana. Thank you, Satya, and a very warm welcome on behalf of Gender in Physics Working Group. Um, Gender in Physics Working Group, or more popularly known as GIPWG, was set up under Indian Physics Association in 2017 with the aim to promote gender equity in physics profession in India. The group has been actively working in promoting the awareness on gender issues and understanding discipline specific issues and also liaises with similar national and international groups. A first national conference dealing with gender in physics issues was organized in 2019 at University of Hyderabad. Uh, and one of the main organizers, uh, Sabindu Bamba is in audience today. And deliberations culminated into the Hyderabad Charter, which has received more than 500 endorsements. The GIPWG, IPA, and KIFR will be co-organizing IUPAP-sponsored uh, international conference on women in physics in July 2023. On the eve of EQIP, the lecture series Pavinari started with an aim to cherish the creditable work of women physicists, sometimes not so well known. Pavinari stands for Padartha Vigyan Ki Nariya, that is women in physics. Today is the fourth lecture in this series. Previous lectures are also available in the YouTube. Today's lecture is on Lisa Meitner, who played a critical and significant role in discovery of nuclear fission, one of the landmark discoveries of the last century. And to tell her inspiring story, today we have her with us, Professor Amit Roy. As Satya mentioned, Amit Roy is well known to most of the audience here, but we also have people on the YouTube. And so for those who don't know him, let me give a brief introduction. Amit Roy completed his master's in physics from Delhi University in 68 and then joined TIFR. He did his PhD in TIFR in 1975 and continued working here till 1990. He then joined uh, Inter-University Accelerator Center, formerly known as Nuclear Science Center, in 91. And he also was a director there from 2001 to 2013. At IOAC, he led the team for building the superconducting LINAC 
and pioneered the development of niobium superconducting cavity for accelerators in India. His research interests are in nuclear physics, accelerator physics, and atomic physics. He is a fellow of National Academy of Sciences India. He has received many awards, among them the Eminent Scientist Award of Indian Nuclear Society and Meghnath Saha Memorial Lecture Award of NASI. He was DAE Rajaramanna Fellow at VCC Kolkata. He has been a guest lecturer at Indian Association for Cultivation of Science Kolkata and an advisor at Manipal Center for Natural Sciences. He has served as a member of governing boards and councils of several institutes and also as a member of many national and international scientific and technical committees. He enjoys communicating science, has written the Great Experiments in Physics series in Journal of Science Education, Resonance, and a book by the same name. And I must add, I was fortunate enough to take a graduate course given by him about the landmark experiments when I started in the TFR as a graduate student in 1988. So uh, without further ado, we look forward to listening to the fantastic story of Lisa Meitner from Amit Roy. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Vandana. Uh, this is a, a great honor for me for giving this uh, joint uh, binary asset colloquium. And I thank the uh, Gender and Physics Working Group of the IPA uh, for inviting me, as well as the asset uh, colloquium organizers and, uh, from TIFR. And especially, uh, I thank uh, Professor Vandana Anal for uh, actually asking me to give this lecture. In fact, that was about, about, I think, four or five months ago. She asked me to speak on this on this on on one of these occasions, and I uh, chose uh, Lisa Meitner uh, for the, this in this for this case. Um, I could have talked about others, but I think I I only wanted to focus on Lisa Meitner. Especially the title has been given as Overlook for the Nobel, uh, Lise Meitner and the Discovery of Fission. So now the, uh, let me just uh, first share this screen with you and then I'll start. Uh, the, I think the screen is, uh, is visible to you. I'll make it a full screen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, the particular... See, the Nobel uh, Prize is, is a coveted one all over the world and considered the pinnacle of, of achievement for any scientist uh, or you know, in the field of literature or other or in, in, in peace and economics as well. And um, usually the Nobel committees do not make, I mean, they have not made too many mistakes in choosing the right persons to be given this award. However, there has been several cases in the in the history of Nobel uh, Prize prizes that many deserving candidates and those who really their work cried out for being recognized have been overlooked. And Lise Meitner, to my mind, is one of the prime examples of such a uh, missed out case, which was uh, she, she was denied the Nobel, uh, where especially especially for the central role that she laid in the discovery of fission, which is a, really a landmark discovery. And in fact, the discovery of fission, as you all know, changed the way science is conducted all over the world since that time. And, uh, and we, whatever we see today, the large investments in sciences in, by different, different countries in the nations of the world is because of the discovery of fission and, and its fallouts, both, in, both for defense as well as for for civil use. So with that, I'll start. And uh, this thing, okay. If you are able to see this slide, you'll see that the Nobel Prizes have been awarded several men over the years. Uh, we have from, from 1901, they have been uh, every year, except for a few years during the World War One and World War II, they were not given. And so far, 60 women have received 61 prizes. And in fact, Sat Satya, when I first uh, showed him this, he had a question, why, why 61? Of course, you all know that uh, Madame Curie won two uh, Nobel Prizes. And then 898 men and 27 organizations have received this Nobel Prize over the years. And if you see the women's share, subject-wise, has been quite, quite low and especially abysmal in physics and economics. It's only just... 1.8% and 2.2%. In others, don't, in chemistry does it slightly better, 4.2%. Uh, 
medicine does a little better, 5.3. Literature and trees is they're not so bad. I mean, I would say 14% and 16%, considering uh, the, especially the uh, sciences are very, very, very they're, and especially so, because there is, I can say it for in physics alone, there has been several glaring examples of women not being considered for the prize when they were actually deserving. And we, we, they had played a central role in the, in the discoveries for which others have been given. Okay, with this introduction, I'll just start with the uh, Lisa Meitner story and, uh, and how she rose to be a true, truly a great scientist of the 20th century, despite the problems that she faced right from the beginning in uh, going to a school and going to college, university, college, etc., and enduring throughout her works, establishing a career. And she finally came out successful, even though she was not recognized by the Nobel. Well, uh, Lisa Meitner was born in, uh, in Vienna on and, and 7th November 1878. And here is a picture of uh, um, her mother, Hedwig, with, the, with uh, Lisa, Lisa Meitner and her, and her siblings. There were seven of them at that time. Her mother was pregnant at that time when, the, when this uh, picture was taken. And there was an eighth uh, brother, brother uh, who was born. And uh, Lisa is the one who is holding the doll. There are two, uh, two sisters, uh, elder to her, uh, Adele, Gilda and, and Giselle, Giselle, who is Gusti, who was the actually, whose son also became a physicist, uh, Robert Frisch, who also played an important role with uh, Lisa Meitner in the fission discovery later on. She was born in Vienna in seven, on 7th 7, 1878, and then uh, she started, she was right from, and this is just a, I have shown here the, uh, the chronologically the, the periods she spent in different places. So until 19, 1907, she was at Vienna. She studied there. I will go, uh, I'll go through that, how, what struggles she had to go through to get, get to uh, the university. And then in uh, 1907, she shifted to Berlin uh, and the Berlin in University there. And uh, she was there for 31 years during the period with, when she at the end, she was she almost came to the final discovery of the fission uh, phenomena, but she had to leave Berlin. Uh, in fact, flee flee from Germany because of the Nazi regime at that time. And then, uh, thirty eight to six, 1960, she was at Stockholm in Sweden, and then uh, she retired formally. Uh, she had uh, she had retired by that time, and then from sixty to sixty eight, she spent at uh, Cambridge in uh, in England. Uh, to be near the, her nephew, Robert Frisch, who was there at Cambridge. And she passed away finally on 27th October 1968, just a few uh, days before her 90th birthday at Cambridge. And she was, for just to uh, give her stature, I mean, she was how she was uh, considered by her peers at that time um, during, during her life, she was for, nominated for the Nobel Prize 48 times, 1924 to 1965. It's remarkable. I mean, in fact, people, I mean, uh, these uh, people like Compton, Bohr, um, uh, um, von Loy, uh, then uh, all the all the known uh, all that top uh, physicists of that time had nominated her for this. Rutherford himself also nominated. Even even later, uh, Otto Hahn also nominated her. Once. Well, uh, she uh, she had a. I hope you are able to see my full screen from the top to bottom. Yes. Okay. Uh, we, she uh, she was she showed a uh, she had an independent spirit right from her uh, right from childhood. In the, well, her parents were uh, of Jewish origin, but. They were not very highly religious. They are not uh, very uh, not the fundamentalist. They had they were very open-minded people, and uh, they allowed uh, a lot of thoughts, different different uh, uh, types of thoughts to go come, and then encourage their children to think for themselves. Especially uh, her father Philip uh, uh, Meitner, who was a lawyer, he, he was uh, he was really he encouraged the children all to study. To UB2, we, uh, and uh, for the education, he, he supported them. Uh, 
the problem of at Vienna at that time was that for in the schools for the for girls they they could go to formal school till the age of 14 and beyond that there was no facility for for girls to study in a school so uh, lise uh, uh, studied up to 14 years of age and then she had to be at home and but then uh, father because, because her, uh, she he, she was encouraged by her father she kept on studying and then at the end uh, two, and around two, 1900 or so uh, she appeared for what an exam there was there used to be a fine examination called matura at at, at vienna austria where if you pass that uh, if a school living examination you could get admitted to the university and her elder sister gisela had already done that on matura and she was she had joined the medical uh, school medical college and uh, lise was encouraged to do that and in one year she learned with a private tutor and in one most just about a year she finished about six or seven subjects and then appeared for the exam, final examination of matura the school living uh, uh, certificate examination and and she passed that um, and then jo joined the university Nin in 1900 fortunately for her for the first time in in vienna the university opened the doors to women can women students and she was one of the first batches to enter vienna university 1901 and attended classes and she uh, got interested in physics she was uh, she used to listen to lectures of ludwig boltzmann famous one and uh, and boltzmann was in and she according to her uh, right, uh, her recollections she uh, the, she said this boltzmann was an inspiring uh, lecturer uh, and, uh, and he was passionate for the she, he could transmit the passion for physics that to these to his students and Leah Meitner uh, had uh, imbibed that passion for physics from from Boltzmann and she was the first woman at the Vienna University to study physics then she starts uh, in the, she continued in that and then in 1905 she finished her uh, the studies uh, the completed the, the courses and started research under Franz Exner uh, on uh, he was Exner was working on basically uh, thermal um, uh, the, the heat transport at etc and uh, he the choice the subject that uh, Lise Meitner chose was the Maxwell's formula for the conduction of electricity in an inhomogeneous solid and all that applied also to conduction of heat he showed that in within a very short time actually the the requirements for just a PhD thesis was was not very rigorous in uh, in, in Vienna these courses were more important that you have to finish so many courses coursework which she did by the by 1905 and in you know, in about a less than a about a year or so less than a year she could write up did some measurements and then um, could write up a thesis in february 1906 she got the phd uh, for, in physics she was the second woman at the vienna university to get a phd degree now the problem was at that time her father was then uh, worried that what she would do after the uh, after getting a PhD degree because the jobs were very scarce and there was no and women were not allowed to teach at uh, in the university so she then she, she so he encouraged her to take a um, uh, examination for the for teaching profession in a, in a school and so she the parts passed that examination and for teaching teaching and then start teaching in a girls school in the daytime and in the in the evening she would go to the lab laboratory at Vienna university and started work with the, in, uh, in radioactivity with stefan meyer who was a student of uh, franz exner and stefan meyer has had had a lot of contributions in radioactivity later on and in that time itself she in a year's time she started working on with beta radiation as well as alpha radiation and alpha uh, uh, at that time by that time the alpha uh, the, uh, the three alpha beta gamma rays were uh, found out or discovered um, and then uh, identified by Rutherford and uh, she she found a way of collimating the alpha particles through using very thin tubes and then uh, with that she could get a beam of alpha particles generate from the source alpha sources radioactive radioactive sources and could scatter and then saw the scattering of these alpha particles from different materials 
And she found out that the scattering increased with the atomic mass. In fact, this was one of the, uh, one of the things which uh, probably, uh, and she published that thing in 1907, and uh, Rutherford, uh, then he started his experiments, alpha scattering, um, on, the, on this, the famous experiment, Rutherford experiment that we know of, which was conducted actually by Geiger and Marston uh, in 1908 to 19, and they continued for about five years, 1913, and Rutherford discovered the nucleus through this process of scattering. Uh, and it is remarkable that uh, Lisa Meitner had thought of these scattering experiments even at that time in the alpha particles and got an important result that the scattering increased with atomic mass. Then uh, at that time, uh, Boltzmann, actually 1907, he, he, he passed away and uh, Max Planck had visited uh, Vienna University uh, uh, on an offer and uh, he, was, he, was being, uh, uh, he was being offered the position of uh, Boltzmann at uh, Vienna University. And so Planck came to see uh, the visit, visit the place. And then he gave a lecture. And then um, uh, at that time, Lisa Meitner was impressed by the Planck's lecture uh, about, it, about what he talked about and the way he, um, he, he, he interacted with people. And uh, so she thought of going to Berlin. And because Berlin was there at the time for German speaking uh, people working in science, it was a kind of magnet. And uh, there were people like Einstein uh, and Planck and uh, Rubens were so all there. And uh, this, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute also, uh, Kaiser, there, there was, a, there was it being formed under the uh, Berlin University around that time. And so uh, she wanted to go there. And she, uh, but they, she had no money. She, uh, so uh, her father uh, helped out, and uh, she uh, she told her father that, well, I let me go and spend a few semesters there, uh, and then uh, I'll see what to do. I, I want to study there for a few semesters. So she went uh, in 1907 to Berlin and uh, attended lectures by Max. When, he, when he, she went to, went to uh, attend lectures by Max Planck, Max Planck told her. Well, you already have a doctorate. Why, why do you want to again study? Um, but Lise was very uh, keen to learn more of physics because she was she wanted to get the the the, the ideas from the, of the quantum quantum theory, etc., which she didn't know about by that at that time from Planck and uh, the also the other lectures that were given by other um, professors there. And uh, so she was attending the lectures and then uh, found that uh, the, these lectures were not uh, occupying the full time. I mean, she was not able to, I mean, th th it was not actually occupying most of her time. So she wanted to start some experiments. And Max Planck was the professor of theoretical physics. And the other uh, professor of experimental physics was Heinrich Rubens. And Rubens is the person, if you will remember, uh, who measured the black body radiation based on which Planck gave this, uh, this his Planck's theory. Of, and he, he he put this quantum idea of quantum in it, although he did he himself Planck didn't believe it in, in, in himself. Uh, so Heinrich Rubens uh, was uh, well uh, he was uh, Lise was uh, Meitner was a very shy uh, type of person and was hesitated in talking to Heinrich Rubens and uh, she found he hesitated to uh, propose that she will work with Rubens herself. herself. But then Rubens indicated that uh, Otto Hahn was an assistant to Emil Fischer, who was a professor of chemistry, uh, and uh, Hahn was interested in collaborating with her. So, uh, so Rubens intru introduced uh, Hahn to um, Lisa Meitner, and they uh, sort of kind of hit it off, and they, they found that each other, they were of the same age. Uh, in fact, uh, they were just the difference the they were born on less than a year apart, and uh, they could. They, they were both interested in radioactivity because Han had already, uh, Otto Han had already uh, worked on radioactivity with uh, Rutherford, uh, first in Cambridge and then uh, Cavendish Laboratory, and then uh, with Rutherford at Montreal. And then he came back to uh, Berlin. And he joined because he was in radio chemist, so he joined the chemistry department. But in the chemistry department uh, that with uh, Emil Fischer's group, he was an oddity because others, uh, the work on radioactivity, the other chemists didn't understand what was going on, what this guy was doing. 
So he found that he was looking for also someone to work with who was interested in the activity and found that Lisa Meitner was the right person. And they hit it, hit it off very well. But then there was the problem arose that the Herman Emil Fisher is also a big, uh, he was one of the great scientists, great chemists of that time. He was in the, the director of that chemistry department and he was a professor there. He didn't agree uh, to let her let Lisa Meitner go into the lab because he he thought that the he believed that the women with long hairs will uh, their hairs will ca catch flame in the in the, in the chemistry in the, in the, in the lab. Uh, it's very ironic that he himself was sported a long beard and which <laughs> he didn't think that it will catch fire, catch fire. So, but then he did, he was didn't allow uh, at that time. Uh, but then finally he agreed that yes, Meitner can work uh, at the at the basement of the laboratory, but cannot get in, into the building. So in fact, they were given a woodworking shop, which was previously a woodworking shop in the basement, and that room was given to them. So the Han and I might not they converted it into a, a laboratory where they did radioactivity measurements. Started that in 1908, 19, late 1907. 1908. But to the credit of Emil Fisher, after one year, when the women were allowed finally to join Prussian universities, Fisher lifted the ban on the Meitner and she was allowed in, inside the building. But then, but the problem was with the other people, the other uh, work, other uh, science, the technicians and the other science, and scientists in the chemistry department. They didn't. Uh, they didn't like. Uh, they didn't actually like the idea of uh, Liz the Meitner woman coming in and working in the in the in the in the department. And so, in fact, at times it would happen that the uh, the technician somebody will come into the or some they'll meet them. They were might say Otto Hahn and Liz Meitner are going together. They'll meet someone. They will all greet uh, Herr Hahn, but just completely ignore Meitner. But uh, she kept. She didn't. Uh, she didn't allow. She didn't allow all this to come into the into her work. And she determined in a, in a determined way. She start work worked on the on her on her radioactivity uh, things and with with Otto Hahn. And they this pair matched very well because Hahn was a very good chemist, extremely methodical and and um, very. Uh, uh, very uh, meticulous and to, and, and uh, systematic one uh, person, and he was an extremely good chemist in very very skilled in chemistry in the radio radio chemistry and separations of of isotopes. And Meitner, for physics contribution, the understanding she had a much bigger, broader outlook to the uh, to this uh, to the uh, the actual experiment. And so they joined hands, and they could they the the match each other's skills very well, complemented each other. Very well, and they found a good team, and they kept on working there. At the, and over the years, they worked together for thirty-one years, till uh, um, uh, they might not had to flee Germany. And uh, they they did a lot of work, and a lot of uh, many of the radioactive uh, uh, many many new new uh, radiation these beta spectra they they the beta, beta emitters they identified uh, over the years, and they they had the steady stream of publication started coming from their lab. This is the laboratory where uh, this is the picture in 1908 uh, or 9 uh, in the woodworking lab converted into a laboratory. This is Otto Hahn and Lisa Meitner sitting there. And uh, Meitner had built this beta spectrometer at that time to study these beta uh, spectra. And she, she studied the, the, uh, the absorption of beta rays. And that's how she could find out if the absorption, uh, the, the absorb, uh, with the different absorption, absorb, uh, the uh, she could identify the beta's by the amount of absorption into the in, in the uh, in different materials, and uh, they so very soon they discovered a new radio radioactive isotope, two thousand eight thallium, and uh, through the proce process of the, which is called the recoil method of separation isotopes. That is, if an alpha particle is emitted by a radioactive uh, radioactive substance, the the uh, emit the the, per the nucleus which emits the alpha particle will get a recoil. And so the, the the daughter product will come out of the if it, if we take a thin foil and put the radioactivity on that the the alpha if you if you observe the alpha particle coming out of the um, uh, the thin thin uh, the, uh, the the material 
uh, the on one side the recoil will come out of the of the uh, plate on the other side so that way they, it's a very clean separation of the isotopes could be made uh, especially for alpha emitters and this method uh, uh, Weitner and Hunt uh, came uh, came out together and this is called the recoil method of separation isotopes with through which they could identify many of these um, many such al alpha emitters which result in a in a radioactive new radioactive isotope they could identify and uh, at that time, uh, this is uh, around 1908 uh, and 29th September. This I don't know. Uh, this is not very clear. I mean, I uh, from reading about her uh, life, I could not make out why she officially got converted from Judaism, Judaism from, uh, to a Protestant. She went to the uh, congregation and then uh, converted herself to a Protestant uh, in 2000, 1908 at Vienna, and they came back. Uh, the reasons are not known, but then she always cherished the idea. The the she liked the Protestant uh, the, the the ethos of Protestant Christianity, always. Okay, now uh, she continues uh, her work, and then uh, all this time she was working without any pay, and dependent on the stipend that her father was sending from Vienna. In 1912 only, after working for almost four and a half years, Planck appointed Meitner as the first female assistant in whole of Russia. This was our first paid appointment. And within a year, Emil Fischer also appoints her, appointed her as a scientific associate of the chemistry department. And at that time, there was a change, this uh, particular, uh, the, the Chemistry department, chem chemistry also, there was a separate institute of, of chemistry was constructed, a Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Chemistry in, in 1913. This was constructed through the go partly government funding and partly through the industry funding. And so this uh, industry funding gave, it, gave them a lot of uh, freedom to choose uh, things and uh, some freedom of oper operations, administrative operations. And so they could get uh, more, more uh, they could get more facilities for their work. And uh, soon, uh, Han, Otto Hahn was appointed the de deputy director of that Kaiser Institute. And then uh, within a few years, Meitner was the heading the physics section and the, the chemistry institute, Kaiser Institute of Chemistry. And in 1914, uh, she received an offer from New York Prague for, for, a, uh, for a regular appointment in the at a junior uh, uh, appointment in the, in the teaching profession, but that would give her the en uh, entry to the to the professorship uh, in Prague, which is a definite, very attractive offer. Then uh, Planck learned about it and then talked to Fisher and told her the, told him that uh, this is a, this is a very good offer for uh, Lisa Meitner and she might leave. And so then Fisher agreed to double her salary at that time and in the Kaiser Institute. And she, so she stayed on. In, uh, in around 1915, the, the, during the uh, war, uh, the Austrian war they started. Uh, this was actually the, the during the uh, first world uh, first world war. Uh, she vol volunteered at the extra technician in the Austrian army, and uh, and Otto Hahn was was also she, he was conscripted in the German army. And he went to the fight at the frontier, but and Meitner volunteers the extra technicians because she was she had volunteered with the Austrian army. She had some free time. She could go. She could come back uh, on on, if, on some of the time after a week or so. She could come back for a few days to the laboratory to in Berlin from from Vienna. She could come back to Berlin and then work on the lab in the lab. So during the years when she was this going on, uh, nineteen fifteen to seventeen, she was the radiologist and extra technician. In the in the uh, Austrian army, she continued to do her experiments at Berlin, and uh, of course Han uh, would get only very very uh, small uh, time, free time from the army. Once in a while, only she would be he will be able to come. But then they continued the work, uh, they, they, and they they found out uh, some. They, they do, and they, even during the years, they had publications had not stopped. They had published probably about 10 to 12 papers during the, this time on the radioactivity. 
1918, she was made the head of physics section. And uh, in March 8, in 1918, at that time, they together with Han, they discovered the new element, radioactive element called protoactinium Pa. This symbol is Pa. In fact, she her reputation grew, and, uh, and Einstein had uh, used to he called her the, our German Marie Curie. So she had a she had built up her standing in, enough at the uh, as a physicist by that time that to be recognized as a as a as a as a, as a scientist who was capable who was giving her giving a doing significant contribution to the field of the of radioactive radioactivity and uh, found out found already a new element which is very, which itself is a, is a very few people that have achieved that uh, in the lifetime finding a new element and uh, also the new methodologies of uh, radioactive uh, for beta decay computer counting as well as I, as I told you about the collimating the alpha particle and scattering of alpha particles and had several good contributions. And uh, her st and standing can be uh, seen uh, that in this uh, 1920, there was when Niels Bohr came to give a colloquium at uh, Berlin, and you can see the galaxy of, uh, of stars physics at that time, the physics, uh, uh, the people who in the physics were all uh, listed here with Otto Stern and uh, Frank H and uh, James Frank. And the ones I have marked red with red stars are, are, are the Nobel, La 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 Nobel laureates which uh, they received the Nobel Prize uh, sometime or the other. And, uh, and this, this is even they, this, pers this person is Hans Geiger, who is uh, famous for the, uh, the Rutherford experiment. So, uh, so she was considered the, their peers the, at, at, the level, at that level. That means her standing as a physicist was already acknowledged by all her peers at that time. And she was at the, at the, le at the top international level. Uh, then she continues her work in 1920. Uh, uh, we took our investigations with her students. And in 1921, significantly, Mani Sigman from the Lund University, he was in, in Sweden. He was a professor there. He had invited her to be a visiting professor for a year. And, and uh, might, Lisa might know went there for not for, for the full, full year, but she was there for several months. And then uh, they did some experiments there and also gave lectures at the university. And there she met uh, uh, a Dutch physicist, Dirk Koster, who actually played a very significant role later on in her life, as, uh, as we'll, I'll find out. Um, so uh, this, uh, Dirk Koster was working on X-rays with uh, Mani Sigman. In fact, uh, our, uh, there's one Professor Bidhushekar Rai, uh, uh, from Calcutta University, who was a Raman student, had also gone to Manis Sigban uh, for, for, the, for his studies. And Manis Sigban played a very significant role later on, as you will see, because he became the, he was the chair of the Nobel Committee of for Physics later on. In, uh, so in nine, these, are, these are some of the things which uh, chronologically happened to, I mean, this, some recognitions that came to her. Uh, in 1922, they did another significant discovery. Again, discovered the cause for electron emission of the surfaces, which is known as the Ozier effect later on. In fact, this she published in 1922, but it was a part of a very de detailed uh, work on the electron emission uh, processes from different for the uh, for radiation effect, radiation effect, and the and the X-ray effect on the materials, and then so and so detailed ones. And she mentioned this part that the electron emitted emitted through this internal uh, the, the instead of the radiation being emitted the in in the atomic inside that the inner electrons could be thrown out instead of a photon being emitted that she had mentioned in that in that particular one as one of the causes and that Pierre Osher Osher in 1923 published this effect in much more detail and somehow it had got known as the Osher effect and not by not as the Meitner effect, uh, but that's again a very significant discovery. In 1926, she got a uh, the what is called the 
ex extraordinary professorship at Berlin University. This is actually like a, this is not, uh, this is a first step to becoming a professor, full professor. Full professor is the ordinary professors are the, are the, are the, are the uh, final ultimate uh, level of professorship in, 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 the, in those days in the German, German universities. So this she became the uh, outsider uh, ordinary, ordinary professor, that is extraordinary professor. And uh, in 1984, the Prussian Academy gave her the sciences, uh, the, uh, the silver Leibniz medal. And uh, 1925, she received the Vienna Academy of Sciences Ignaz Leven Prize. 28, she got the American Ellen Richards Prize shared with the French scientist Lamart Lucas. And many other uh, awards she kept on getting from different places uh, at this time. So, and in fact, first time she was nominated for the Nobel Prize in 1925 itself for her work by, uh, uh, till that time. And uh, 1929, this is, a, this is a photograph with Rutherford when he was visiting the, uh, for the meeting of the German Chemical Society. This is Otto Hahn, uh, Lisa Weidner, and Rutherford at the time. In fact, Rutherford there is a story of uh, Lisa Weidner. When actually Rutherford first came to Berlin in 1908, when he had received the Nobel Prize uh, for chemistry. And so uh, he, on the way back from Sweden, Rutherford had visited Otto Hans, uh, Otto, uh, visited Otto Hans because uh, Otto was his student. And uh, so when uh, he got introduced to Lise Meitner, he was surprised. He said he thought that Lise was a, was a man. In fact, that's what uh, he, he said, that he was very surprised to see this, uh, this, uh, he, that Lise Meitner is a lady. Although, in all the papers, Lise Meitner had put her full name. I mean, Otto Hahn and Lise Meitner, they were writing two papers together and they mentioned their names. So, yeah, that's what, that was rather cool. And uh, there is, uh, the, I, I show some, some of the pictures here. I'll, I'll uh, go through them just to show the, her position in the, in the community of physicists at that time. And this is a very uh, interesting picture from Niels Bohr's Institute of Physics, Copenhagen. There was a special colloquium seminar there. And you can see the galaxy of uh, physicists in there with Bohr, Pauli, Heisenberg, Max Born, uh, Meitner, Stern, Frank. And then we have our Meg Professor Meghnath Shahad, Dr. Meghnath Shahad sitting here, and Dr. Homi Bhava also there. They attended that particular meeting in Copenhagen. And there is a uh, uh, Dirac also somewhere here. And uh, there are many other Compton and Dirac, they're also there inside in this picture. Uh, this is another picture where uh, this all the again, top physicists uh, used to gather so in the Solvay Congress in Brussels, 1933. This is a famous picture where there is um, uh, Mary, Madame Curie there, uh, Irene Curie is here, and uh, Lisa, and Lisa Meitner is here. And so are, of course, Niels Bohr it's, and, other, and Schrodinger and so many other people. Okay, now we come to the uh, central story of, of this fission, uh, to, uh, which is there uh, for the, which I focus on the, uh, the, Nobel, uh, the Nobel Prize, the controversial Nobel Prize, so to say. Uh, they started with the, uh, of course, other four discuss you all as all of all of all of you know that the 1911 Rutherford gave the idea of the nucleus, and then the new proton was discovered in 1917. Proton was found out, and then the the, the, the neutron was discovered by James Chadwick in 1932. Now, once the neutron was discovered, of course, by the time the 1924, 20, 20, 24 to 27, artificial radioactivity was already Found by uh, Irene and Julia Curie, they uh, they could create they created artificial radioactivity by bombarding alpha, alpha particles on uh, aluminium. Then Enrico Fermi got interested in 1934, uh, 1930 around 1933, 1934 in uh, doing experiments in nuclear physics, and so he uh, he found out that he thought that neutrons would be a good, much better source. Uh, for creating artificial radioactivity because of its penetrability is much better than the alpha particles with the neutron being a neutral particle. So he started his work. He, he had made a good, very good uh, neutron source with a 
mixing uh, red on with uh, beryllium uh, powder and uh, with his with his experimental skills he could he devised a, the one of the best neutron sources at of that time uh, and then uh, and with the neutron source he started bombarding every element that he could find he went to the chemist all the chemist labs in rome at that time he found out whatever material was with them with different elements he picked him up and started bombarding with neutrons and, and, and lo and behold every time he did that of course he found out that neutron capture will take it to the higher heavier isotope and then isotope in most of the times will have a beta decay and, and go to the next element and uh, so he, he kept on doing this uh, thing and uh, he kept and finally uh, he went to uranium last the heaviest element that he and in the uranium, when he bombarded, he found not just one particular uh, beta beta emitter, but he found that several beta emitters were there. So he thought that uh, by from analogy of the of the lighter elements, which you, neutron capture produces the next uh, higher atomic number uh, element. So he thought that the uranium also is uh, capturing neutrons. So he must have gone to a heavier ninetieth element number ninety three. In uranium's atomic number 92, and so the next one will be the 93. So he he didn't, didn't fully claim because he could not prove it, but he had in his paper he pub, he published or he just he cautiously put these words that possibly we have seen a transuranic element. Now that created a lot of interest. Already his, his papers were being looked, I mean, people were waiting for uh, this, his uh, Fermi's results of uh, finding new elements, uh, creating new elements and artificial radioactivity all over the world, especially in Cambridge and uh, in Berlin, Berlin and, and Paris. And uh, in fact, Rutherford, in fact, was, had written to Fermi a letter which uh, is saying that uh, he's, he congratulated him for Going, doing, doing experiments and leaving, leaving the uh, useless work of theory, and coming and doing some real useful work in experiments. That's that's what he had written. Other word written for me at that time. Uh, so this heavy element, heavy, claim, claim of heavier element than uranium really interested many people. And uh, in fact, one should remember when this this was this this lady was forgotten. There was a lady, Ida Noddak, in Germany, who had actually found some, uh, she had worked, done some very good work on uranium, identifying uranium, uh, uh, the element. And she suggested and written to both Otto Hahn and Fermi on the possibility of breaking, break up of iridium by neutrons instead of going to the uh, heavier element. But then they ignored because she, the, uh, but Previously, not Duck had written about some particular uh, element in technetium, connected with technetium, which was found to, uh, to be incorrect. And so her uh, comments were ignored by both Otto Hahn as well as Fermi. But then, unfortunately, not, Ida not Duck also did not pursue that any further on this neutron wall. But then this work was picked up by Otto Hahn, Lisa Meitner and Otto Hahn. And they recruited a uh, uh, Han recruited a uh, a young uh, chemist as his assistant, uh, Fritz Strassmann. Actually, the T is missing here. Strassmann. Uh, and uh, the other group, which was which started uh, work on his uh, on these things, well, in all seriousness, was Irene and Frederick Joliot Curie at Paris. They followed the Fermi, Fermi's research and started working <coughs> on neutron bombardment uh, of uranium. And seeing what the, the what kind of activity is produced there. So uh, the Fermi and as, is, as I said, Fermi and collaborator discovered several simultaneously formed beta emitters. And Hahn, Meitner, and Strassmann confirmed that uranium experiments of Fermi and also identified the presence of uranium two thirty nine as a beta emitter with a half life of twenty three minutes. The Julio Curies also confirmed Fermi's work. Then there were several uh, radio, the, the, the radioactivities, beta emitters were there. And in particular, in 1938, they identified a 3.5 odd radioactive isotope that had the chemical properties of lanthanum. <coughs> but the thing is, they just left it at that, suggesting that the, this is the chemical properties of lanthanum.
at that time the the, the uh, uh, Meitner was a little critical of uh, this having the uh, considering the Fermi's suggestion that a transuranic uh, element has been formed and so they were Hahn and Meitner both actually they started looking for alternate explanations to the uh, what this be and finding out what this beta emitters would be. So, but then unfortunately at that time, you know, in 1938, she had to, in July 1938, she had to, uh, Meitner had to, because by 1933, Hitler had come to power in Germany. And then by, by 19, she had, uh, a lot of, lot of physicists started leaving in Germany, but Meitner was protected in some way because of her Austrian citizenship. She had an Austrian passport. But in 1938, the beginning, around February, uh, March, the Hitler annexed Austria. And so it became a part of the German Empire. And her citizenship, Austrian citizen was invalid and she became a German citizen. And so the German law, uh, rules that uh, Hitler had imposed about the Jews not uh, having, or not will not have any uh, government will not be in any government service. So her uh, professorship was terminated and uh, she, she and then her, uh, there was a threat to her life itself. There, there of course, a lot of people tried to help her out and work out. Uh, Bohr was concerned, Niels Bohr was concerned and, and there are many others out, outside Germany were concerned. They were trying to uh, take up, find an alternative appointment for uh, Lisa Meitner at that time in you know, somewhere else. Uh, but Lisa Meitner herself was very reluctant to leave Germany as such, because her whole life she has spent, she has she was so focused on on science, she had completely not thought about anything else. I mean, that was her one goal in life. I mean, all, all her concentration was on the on this on the doing this science, nothing else. And uh, I mean, the people, in fact, many some people asked her why she didn't uh, get married. Uh, she said that. I don't didn't have any time. That was her, her reply. So this focus on this work, and then she, then and being in Berlin, she had had built her career. She had got so much from from the recognition by the time to from her peers, from the physicists all around in, in Germany as well as outside. They recognized her, and so she was very reluctant to leave, leave Germany, but. When it was apparent to others, apparent to everybody, that there was really a threat to her life, that she could be arrested any time, and then these so people started uh, working to take her out, and in fact, in that uh, these three gentlemen from the Dutch physicists, they really helped her out. Dave Koster, Adrian Fokker, and Wonder uh, the J J J Haas. In fact, all of them are. Uh, well-known physicist, Koster was uh, the person who actually he, he is a chem he was physicist and chemist both. He is the, his the discoverer of hafnium, and Adrian uh, Fokker, as you know, is a is one of the is the first author of Fokker Planck equation. And D has for those who are in condensed matter will know D has one of an effect in in condensed matter. So the this this three as physicists they had started looking for uh, ways of helping her, and they. First, I thought they will create a fund to support Lisa Meitner in Holland, but then they, they, they didn't work out. So uh, they wrote, they told Bohr that this is not possible, this is not working out. So Bohr uh, was also trying to contact many people uh, to help her out. And finally, uh, they contacted um, Hans Sigman in, in Sweden. And so Sweden and, and Man Sigman agreed to fund her find some some money for her to support her in in sweden so this the story of how she was he went had taken out did mean, coster came to berlin to escort uh, take lisa Meitner out in fact the thing was it was such a the the atmosphere in the kaiser Wilhelm institute itself became so uh, difficult because a lot of people there were a lot of people from the nazi uh, nazi sympathizers were there installed and they were all watching the movements of everybody else. In fact, by that time, in 1938, when uh, finally the, uh, 
might not agree to leave Germany. At that time, they, in fact, the, the German, the Nazi part, Nazi government had already banned the, even the, the, banned the Jew, Jewish scientists to leave Germany. Earlier, they were allowing them to leave, but 1938, they had stopped all the, anybody um, from leaving the Germany at that time. And uh, Sweden didn't have a, a passport, a valid passport. So she going out was, was also a fraud in danger. But this Koster came to Berlin and finally he, agreed, he escorted her in a train uh, to go to the German uh, Netherlands border, Holland border. And, and the, the Koster had a neighbor who was, who was a politician, in, in Dutch politician who knew the uh, people and through his help, he, he told the, got the border guards, the passport control people to allow this Meitner to, in, to enter Germany, uh, enter Holland without the, the valid papers. So she didn't have any papers anyway. So uh, this itself is a, is a, is a very uh, uh, interesting story, the way she was taken out of the Germany, of, of, of Berlin and uh, the, the secrecy, and the, uh, the, the, the way they had to conduct, Lisa Weidner worked till the last, in the, the day before she, the evening she boarded the train from Berlin, she had worked in the lab. So, not, so as not to arouse any, sus, arouse any suspicion to anybody that she was going to leave. And she worked till eight o'clock in the evening, then went out, went to um, Hans' place. And then, and then from there, Otto Hahn had given her uh, the diamond ring, which she, she, he inherited from her mother, so that in case she needs it, uh, she would have some money. Uh, so Lisa Weidner actually came to in, in Berlin, 1907, a impoverished student, taking, uh, getting having her money from her, I mean, supported by her father. And she leaves 1938 when she was a, already a professor and achieved so much fame, again, with just 10 marks, 10 Deutsche marks in her, in her pocket. And plus the diamond ring, which uh, her friend Otto Hahn had given her. And so, in finally, uh, they reached uh, uh, the, the Koster and uh, accompanying uh, Lisa Meitner reached Holland. Uh, he sent a telegram to, uh, to Bohr saying that they have reached safely. Uh, and then uh, Bohr, of course, told everybody about it. And Pauli wrote a famous telegram to. Dear Coster, you have made yourself as famous for the abduction of Lise Meitner as for the discovery of Hafnium. So uh, then uh, she went to uh, Sweden uh, by, uh, by about, uh, I think after spending um, about, a, about a few days in Holland and then in uh, Copenhagen with Bohr, then she uh, went to Sweden and started uh, uh, and the uh, the uh, at Stockholm and Man uh, Man Sigmund's Institute. Uh, Sigmund was a, he. It's, it's it's not clear that how the the relationship, of course, was not very very cordial with them. Although, at, if you remember, in 1922, Sig, uh, Sigmund had invited her at Lund University when he was a professor at Lund University to give lectures. In his, in that. But at this time, uh, by this time, the, the, the attitude to Sig, Sig, of Sigmund, which she took to Meitner, was that she allowed her, allowed him, her to work uh, on her, in, her, in, her, in her own way, but he did not take any interest in what she was going, going to do. And, uh, it, and, uh, and also, probably from Meitner's side, it was a problem because she, she was very, very, very in a, in a very sad state. She had left. Uh, she I mean, at that time, 1938. She was already uh, 60 years old, um, and uh, she had a lifetime of work which uh, she had to leave, and uh, she was in a very depressed state. So, and by nature, she uh, was, was very shy. So uh, she she couldn't go and you know make up uh, sort of. Probably she didn't uh, somehow. Um, since Mark Sigmund was not forthcoming, she did not uh, have a rapport with uh, with her, with him. Um, the only thing I can say about because 
One Sigman, from the other uh, reports, from her, because he was the director of the institute, from the reports of the other students and other uh, people who worked with, with him, including uh, Bhushan Rai from, in, in, from India, Calcutta. Uh, Sigman was, was, was very, very it, it, it appeared that he was very, very gregarious person and he was also uh, very helpful to the students and which came to him. But maybe that he considered uh, Meitner uh, as a stature wise as a physicist, um, almost equal or even may, maybe higher than him. So maybe there was some kind of a professional rivalry that he felt it's possible. Anyway, that, that might have played a role in the Nobel Committee's decision. That's what I, that's I, the feeling I got by reading the history of, uh, of, of, this, of this time. Okay, so, uh, so uh, the, but then uh, when she was in Sweden, all the time Han was writing up, say, he, Han and Strassman continued the, uh, the chemistry uh, separation of the trying to isolate the radio the isotopes that the beta isotopes which uh, came out as the product of neutron bombardment on uranium. And uh, Han had this uh, idea that this was, this, uh, what was happening is he thought that radium isotopes are being formed because uh, by the alpha, a neutron bombard gets bomb bombards a uranium and the alpha particle is emitted. And so if you have, you have two alpha particles emitted, then it will end up in red in, in a, one of the radium isotopes. Uh, so uh, so this is could be, uh, sorry, not radium, radon isotope. One of the radon isotopes will be there. So he wanted to identify, identify this. Uh, uh, sorry, not radon. Radium. Radium isotope. So he tried to isotope uh, to is analyze analyze this thing chemically and find out if they could isolate the radium. So he tried various techniques, um, and and then 10th November he came to Copenhagen. Han had come to Copenhagen. Uh, he had he had a uh, had some some work in the university, some uh, some uh, for, uh, formal things to do. So he came there and then he talked to Bohr as well and uh, and I might know. And uh, he told them that this is the, uh, I'm, I'm working on the, this idea that the radium isotopes, I'm trying to isolate them. So uh, both Meitner and Bohr are on to re-investigate again this question of radium isotopes and see that whether the radium, because they, they didn't believe that the, these could be radium isotopes. The two alpha particles coming out, uh, I mean, from her uh, nuclear physics background, um, Meitner, Realize that two, two in the, there is not there is not enough energy in this system to give, uh, emit out these two alpha particles there. And she was she knew the masses of the elements of that time in her head. She had all the all the all the numbers in her head, so she could make out. She didn't uh, she she didn't uh, th support the idea that it could be two alpha particle emitting. So he, she asked Bohr, uh, Otto Hahn to re-examine and go and do more chemistry on this. So he went back uh, and uh, after he died, went back in uh, December, Strassman and Hahn examined this 3.5 hour product described by Curie and Savage and found four new substances. Now, from their chemical reaction, they could identify they could be either radium or barium. So they tried to separate these uh, artificial radium from the inactive barium. So how they do it, they did this separation they by fractional crystallization. So they will add a carrier's material, which they, which they thought that the radioactivity will be, and along with the carrier, this part particular, uh, because of the chemical similarity, because if these are the same, chemi same chemical uh, similarity, then they, the same group, they will be precipitated together. So this is called a fractional distillation. But their, all their efforts failed to separate the radium from the barium. And that is shown in this particular uh, uh, cartoon, which is there in the chemistry world uh, website. So you hit the neutron source with uranium compounds. You say this is the, uh, the hypothesis of Hanwal that this radium isotopes is formed. So at the, you dissolve this radium isotopes in the solution. Then you add a barium chloride carrier solution. So that forms a radium and barium solution. Then you, uh, they added the, car, uh, the carbonic acid to that. And then the solution barium carbonate will be precipitated 
and so the if it is uh, if it is radium that will come out in the <coughs> barium so the with the bromine they uh, they again they have treated this barium carbonate and radium so called radium carbonate and they find that radium solution and barium solution comes up together and fractional crystallization they just could not separate this is so called radium from barium so han came to the conclusion that it has to be barium nothing else so whatever is they are seen is a product of uranium neutron bombardment of uranium is barium and so han writes on 19th december to to lise meidner a letter <coughs> but we are coming steadily to closer to the frightful conclusion our radium isotopes do not act like radium but like barium All other element trials, thorium, uranium, thorium, actinium, etc., protoactinium, are out of the question. So I have agreed with Trustman that for now we shall tell only you. Perhaps you can come up with some sort of fantastic explanation. We know ourselves that it cannot actually burst apart into barium. That is, in uranium breaking up into barium is unthinkable at the time because they couldn't think about the, any process that will give this. that just with a neutron tickle uh, tickling the uranium at a uh, big uranium uh, nucleus with a small neutron it just breaks up into two they just couldn't conceive of it now because uh, this letter says uh, now we went to test whether actinium isotope derived from the radium behave not like actinium but lanthanum this is the curian savage which they found that lanthanum like activity so this is uh, but So, 19 December, he writes this note, and then in 22 December, Hahn and Strassman they submit this paper concerning the existence of this particular. In, in actually, it's a German paper. It was submitted to the Natur Naturwissenschaften, uh, and it was published in 11 January 1939, which is translated. You can one can look at this. The American Journal of Physics has translated in 1964. This was translated, and in the in the paper, in the translated version, it says. as chemists we really ought to revise the decay scheme given by uh, given above and insert the symbols barium lanthanum cerium in place of radium actinium and thorium however as nuclear chemists working very close to the field of physics we cannot bring ourselves yet to take such a drastic step which goes against all previous experience in nuclear physics there could perhaps be a series of unusual coincidences which has given us false indications So, what Hahn and Strassman are very, they are they are almost extremely good chemists. So, chemistry was absolutely, I mean, there will no doubt about it. In fact, Meitner never doubted his chemistry results. He, she always believed that what you know, the chemistry that she uh, that Hahn had done has to be right. So, the experiments were right, but the explanations they couldn't get any explanation. so with this this let uh, this this was published separately now at that time this was uh, december and then uh, 19 december letter that came to reach this uh, might not a few couple of days later and uh, so it was getting christmas time and auto fresh he was uh, at, at that time uh, her nephew uh, was at copenhagen he was at uh, the boards and see so he wanted went to visit his aunt during the christmas vacation so near stockholm actually it was not not in stockholm but it was in goteborg they were there so during a walk then there was a, a snow so they did they walk they uh, on the snow they started walking and then this is actually um, version auto fishes recollection that they started walking and then on the ice and uh, my, uh, lise meitner was walking and um, fish was on a ski and then suddenly uh, uh, lise meitner uh, thought that yeah i think i uh, got the idea so they were discussing because the bohr's nils bohr's liquid drop model of the nucleus was already there that the the, the nucleus behaves as a liquid drop so it could vib vibrate and, and and things like that and evaporate evaporate uh, particles out and it could vibrate so so meitner thought that the neutron coming in there could set up the vib vibrations and so it becomes elongated and then it can break up so so on a scrap of sheet sat down on a, on the on the on the um, 
on the tree. The trunk was lying on the ice on this side. So she sat down there and on a scrap paper, she calculated the what will be the coulomb and she immediately calculated, she knew the sizes of the nuclei that will form the, uh, when they break, when this, if this neurodium splits into two. So what will be the coulomb energy at the separation? And she said, this has to be two, a couple of hundred MeVs. Now, so they will fly apart, these two fragments. So if they fly apart with such large energies, then uh, where is the energy coming from? So then from her head, she could figure out the mass, masses of this, uh, these products. So she said, roughly one is barium, so the other one must be something like krypton. So, okay, the masses are like this, so the mass defects. So, yeah, mass defect will do. Mass defect by the Einstein's formula, you convert into energy, and that will be of the order of 200 MeV. And so this matches. So this must be the information. So she sketched on a piece of paper, and Frisch writes that her sketches were not so very good. So she said this is like one, one, uh, one sphere becomes two and so on. So then this particular sketch, sketch he says, Frisch's sketch. So he says, I took whatever my uh, Aunt Tante was saying, then I, I drew these sketches and this is happening. And she said, yeah, this is the right thing. This is what's happening. So that's how they came to the idea. Then um, uh, Frisch came back to Copenhagen and then told Niels Bohr, Niels Bohr was preparing to go to US at that time, sailing in, in, a, in a day's time. Next day, she, he was supposed to sail back, sail to US. So he, according to Frisch's um, report, so Niels Bohr heard it and he said immediately, he hit his forehead and said, what a, oh, what a fool we have been. This is the thing, this is the explanation of this uh, uh, neutron bombardment or uranium. It has to be like this. So uh, he agreed, and he said, uh, you should write, told, uh, he told uh, Otto Frisch that you immediately write a paper and submit it to Nature. So Frisch, of course, uh, then he talked to, uh, on the phone, uh, he talked to uh, Lisa Meitner, and then they discussed over the phone and, and wrote up the paper, and finalized the paper, which is a letter actually to Nature. They decided on sending a letter to Nature uh, explain, explaining this fission uh, uh, process. And of course, the idea of the, the name fission was not, they hadn't come to them as such. In fact, it came to, uh, the, I, the name was given by Frisch. He asked, there was a colleague, William Arnold, an American biologist working in, uh, in John, the, John D. Hefsey's lab uh, in, in, in Niels Bohr Institute. And uh, so he, Frisch asked Arnold, what do you biologists call when the cells divide? So Arnold said, yeah, well, we call it binary fission. So this, uh, this is how the name fission came into nuclear physics. And this was coined by Frisch. And so in their paper, they write about it. And this is the paper, which was probably, and then, and, and then also Frisch, what he did was to measure the fission fragments uh, by, by, he had his, he had his uh, ionization count chambers. And there he could see the pulses, actual pulses of the fission fragments. In fact, for that also, Lisa Meitner had told, uh, had given him a, uh, an advice because it is Lisa Meitner, so he, she had tried to look at the fission, the properties of the, the particles coming out of the uh, neutron bombardment of uranium <coughs> with, a, with a counter in, the, in Berlin. But in her experiment, because there were a lot of copious amounts of alpha particles coming out in the neutron bombardment of uranium. So she had put a uh, thick foil. Actually, this was uh, with her student Droste. Uh, she had performed the experiment and she had put a th in, uh, pretty thick foil, aluminum foil, which was absorbing, trying to absorb, catching all the absorb the alpha particles. In fact, in that process, the fission fragments of obviously would be stopped because fission fragments are much, much heavier and they will be stopped by a lesser amount of material. So if a part, if an alpha, fiber alpha particle gets stopped by aluminum foil, that foil will stop a couple of, um, some tens of MeVs of, of uh, 100 MeV of heavy ions. So that got stopped. So Meitner told Frisch that this is the problem, this could, but might have been the problem with Roster's experiment. So Frisch did not put any, any absorber foil. He, on his ionization counter, he put the uranium and put the, and, uh, the neutron source. And what he did was he electronically suppressed the pulses from low energy pulses from, uh, from alpha particles. He cut off, he cut off this pulses from the alpha particles 
by electronically and could then see the, the big pulses from the fission fragments coming out. And so he wrote this second paper by himself that physical evidence for division of EVA nuclei under neutron bombardment. And the first, part, first paper, this was in a supplement to Nature of the next week in eight, February 18. And February in 11, this paper published this decreation of uranium by neutron, new type of nuclear reactions. So this is the uh, this is where the, the the publications in. Now the thing is uh, well this is the uh, the work table of Meitner and Hahn which was there. Uh, as you can see that this is the actual the measurement. This uh, there is a this is the, all the electronics of that time uh, which the uh, Meitner used for the count for his for her counters. And you can see the these these valve circuits are there. Um, and, and some beakers and so on for the keeping the reactive sources here. And uh, this was this is in Deutsches Museum Munich, and it was labeled actually as the work table of Otto Hahn. In fact, uh, this this was and finally 19, 18, no, 1988 or 89. This was rectified and saying now it is mentioned, it is labeled as the work table of Meitner and Hahn. Now so uh, Frisch named, as I said, Frisch, Frisch named is efficient. The Harman Sachsen published the results separately without Meitner as an author or any acknowledgement to her. Now, this is something which uh, people hold uh, Han uh, guilty of, uh, of no, not putting, uh, acknowledging Meitner or putting her name on that. But one can think, and then uh, just, I would not defend Han uh, in that way. But then you have to also understand the psychology of the person at that time in the Nazi Germany that Meitner had to had left, had to flee the Germany and being a kind of persona non grata in, at that time in, in, in Hitler's Germany. And Hahn and Strassmann, if they, if it was, if it came out that he was communicating with her after she left and also becoming a, and including her author, Hans' position in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the institute would be, would be in jeopardy and his own personal life would be in jeopardy. So it may be that has influenced him in that. But finally, anyway, Han alone was awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1944. Of course, at that time when this was announced, he was in detention in, 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 German, in UK. Uh, the war had... Uh, the Germany, uh, the, the German, many of the German scientists were taken away to uh, to UK, and they kept in a place called Farm Hall. And there, there are books on on that, what happened there, and the the uh, the, the the UK, uh, the you know, the British had wired the entire place so they could record the conversation of all these people. Uh, there were Heisenberg, Mahan, um, uh, von Weizsäcker, all over there. And their conversations are very. That it's, a, it's an it's an interesting story to read. Go into and read that book also uh, on the farm hall story. And there, a uh, uh, lot of accusations and counter accusations went on about the I don't know, nuclear bomb, etc., and, and so on. But uh, anyway, when when this announced in nine, uh, 1944 uh, prize, he was not allowed to go there at that time. But later on, he received the prize in 1946. But then uh, Fritz Stassmann, when he was asked about his uh, Meitner's role, he, she, he all, all the time maintained that Lizzie Meitner led our working group intellectually, even in exile. He said, what does it matter that she was not present during that final uh, result that we got on the Merriam? And she provided the explanation. She was leader and she was giving the leadership to our, 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 our activity. But anyway, but the, what, what actually... Uh, was her pained Lisa Meitner is that although she kept her friendship with personal friendship with Han, uh, continued that she didn't uh, cut off, but she was pained and her, she became a little cool, cool towards Han because of that. She said that Han had suppressed, it is a part of her suppressed past, that he had suppressed his past. He doesn't want to acknowledge, and Meitner is a part of her of his past. 
Meitner's role. So he had didn't want to give any credit to Meitner at that time because he was trying to set up set himself up as a a good German who, even though he stayed in Hitler's German, Nazi Germany, did not join the war or all this all these uh, Nazis and try to be away from them and then continue continue to do good good science and was trying to rebuild german science after the second war and so he didn't want to share the credit of that in mind that probably gives the correct explanation of his behavior although it is not something which we, we uh, which one would like to endorse anyway so this is the uh, story of uh, uh, the Nobel Prize. Uh, then, of course, Hunt did one thing. He shared the money. He gave the money, half the money to Meitner and, and, Fritz, and, and, and uh, Strassman. And Meitner promptly uh, gave the money to Einstein's Fund for, America, for Refugees of the, uh, of the War, in uh, the exile. And uh, that, that was the thing. So this, uh, now, now comes the uh, the, the uh, her role as a perceived. I uh, will take another uh, five minutes. Pandana, is that all yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Uh, just to uh, just to con complete her the story of this Meitner, that she was perceived as the you know outside in outside Germany in the in the, in the US and other places. They were, she was perceived as the person as the as the, as the, uh, as a lady who uh, the refugee lady the Jewish lady who came out. And then uh, she uh, yes, she didn't want to she she, uh, she successfully escaped and helped the allies you know build the bomb. Although in fact in the, the, this is on seventh August paper of New York Sun it's uh, after the bomb was released and uh, on in on Hiroshima. This is the heading the headline says Poe admits bomb caused wide havoc and then there is a, a thing called this woman refugee silent on aid. This is about referring to this the Meitner saying that uh, she, and then he said silent on aid, but there's in the in the write up session that she aided the bomb research. Although when asked to join the Manhattan Project in 1943, she replied, "I have nothing to do with the bomb." And uh, 1946, she uh, visited uh, U.S. Uh, for the first time. And then she was considered the uh, woman of the year of the uh, U.S. National Place Club ceremony. She was given this uh, honor. And then she had a dinner uh, and uh, uh, Harry Truman gave her a dinner. And, and uh, this is a kind of, this is the approach that they took. So he, he told her, so you are the little lady who got us into this atomic mess. Although he, she had no, pro, no role to play in the, the atomic mess that, that we know of. Um, and then her uh, life goes on, uh, 38 to 47, she was in the Nobel Institute in Stockholm, 46 visit to America, 47 to 60, she was a research professor at the Royal Institute of Technology and, uh, and then helped the first nuclear reactor set up in Sweden. She uh, helped them out in that. And uh, in 49, she, she received the tank medal uh, shared with Otto Hahn in German Physics Society. She came back to Germany. This is the first time she came back, came to Germany afterwards, I mean, after that, 49, you know, for receiving this medal. And then uh, she retired in 1953 at the age of 75 from laboratory work, but continued to work with students. 54, she was gave, awarded the Otto Hahn Prize of uh, the German Chemistry Society, uh, travels to Berlin. 55, she was elected for a member of society in London. In 59, there's the Institute, Lise Hahn Meitner Institute for Nuclear Physics Research was opened in Berlin uh, together and this is the at that time of the opening ceremony and there is a Lise Meitner Strasse at that time at that place road named after her in 59 and uh, 60 she had a fall and broke her uh, uh, broke her leg and uh, so she went to England uh, Cambridge shifted to be near Otto Frisch and family and she too she got another award and in 63 she was actually 61 she was given the Order of Porla Merit uh, and of the West and the West German President Heinrich Dukke there. Uh, there to Han and Maiden both got you know, the, this award. And the award ceremony was in 63. And uh, finally, the, she got the Enrico Fermi Prize, uh, which uh, 
Ben Seymour came to Cambridge to give us this prize. And this is Robert Fish at that time. And uh, now October 27, she passes away. And this is the uh, epitaph on her gravestone. This is a Meitner, a physicist who never lost her humanity. And the uh, community, uh, uh, community postage stamp was issued on her, on her name while she was in West Germany in 1988. And finally, she got there's a, an element, uh, number 109, has been named Meitnerium. This was discovered in 1982 at the Gesellschaft uh, für Schwer, Unions uh, for Schuh in uh, Germany, the Heavy Iron Research Center in Darmstadt in Germany. The name was accepted by IUPAC in 1994 and approved in 1997. So this is Meitnerium. And uh, I, I, I end my talk with this particular quotation from Lise Meitner herself. Science makes people reach selflessly for truth and objectivity. It teaches people to do accept reality with wonder and admiration, not to mention the deep awe and joy the natural order of things brings to the true scientist. She was a true scientist, no doubt about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amit, for a very wonderful uh, and uh, very uh, comprehensive story of Lisa Meitner. And this is actually really ended on a very nice quotation and that kind of summarizes uh, her uh, life. I just want to make two short comments before we take questions. Uh, you mentioned two points, actually. That one was that she was given a basement lab. Yeah. I think uh, one of the things which actually struck her, uh, the point is really, really sad thing about that is that left her in isolation. She yes. was left out of all scientific discussions. In yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And yeah. uh, in that book, she actually talks about this visit of Rutherford, that there also she, because Mrs. Rutherford was there, it was expected that she naturally came. Yeah, she will, she will, she will accompany her. Mrs. Rutherford yeah. and not, uh, not take part in the physics discussion. But Correct. one thing she did was uh, that, that, in fact, not only that, I mean, basement, and she wasn't allowed, even there, there was a lady's room there. She yeah, had to go, she had to, uh, go across uh, to uh, about, about, uh, you know, to her uh, place, uh, or some, uh, some couple of hundred meters away for the, uh, going to the yeah, toilet. toilet yeah. And uh, but she found that the physics part of it, physics department, she would at the, uh, attend the, uh, the, the seminars there, and the physicist there with with Planck, the other people, uh, Planck, Rubens, and other Frank, James Frank, and others, they were very congenial. They they became very friendly to her. Yeah. And just the other point, which actually as you said that though she was the intellectual lead, leader of the team. This yeah. is one of the standard thing which was there is that her role in collaboration work was undervalued. It was ignored and its general perception has been, which has remained for decades, is that it's a woman subordinate to a man in the collaboration. I think that's also the sort of thing. There are many questions, so maybe we can take a few. Yes. Uh, Bindu, you can just ask a question. Okay. okay. Uh, mine is a comment more than a question. Um, uh, you know, when you look at the field of nuclear fission, uh, in, uh, there was another woman who was uh, overlooked, and it was um, a chemist named Ida Nordek. And uh, what Ida Nordek did was that during, it, after Fermi's, um, Fermi's theory, she wrote a paper called On the Element uh, 93. And she, uh, uh, she told everybody, uh, she explained how Fermi's had uh, neglected. Uh, elements other than uh, lead to which uranium could have been split to. And she talked about the possibility of a fusion, also, a fusion also. And in fact, Otto Hahn called her work ridiculous when it was first published in 19, uh, uh, and in 19, uh, around 1929. And then she had to leave her lab because she was married to Nordek, uh, and Nordek and, um, and uh, the married women were obligated to re leave their jobs and become housewives so that they could uh, they could spare the space for men at that time. So, you know, so Otto Hahn did have this uh, reputation of sort of waving aside women at first and then having to um, swallow his words. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, that, <laughs> so that's one thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that I know. I mean, I know about that. I mentioned the Ida Nordek's uh, thing that she had written about. In fact, that was in 1938, uh, 1934. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. 1934 or 34? 30, 30, 34. Yeah. No. Two years no, after. Uranium was much around 34. So 34, yeah. she, she had written to both Fermi and Han about this, uh, the idea that it could break up into, into smaller parts. But they ignored yes. her at that time. That. And in fact, called right. it ridiculous. And but, the second... But, but, but uh, the, Han's attitude, if you see, in the beginning, it was not so. See, when she actually they started working together, in 1918, there was a, uh, they, after they uh, discovered this protactinium, there was a uh, award which was given by the German Chemical Society to Otto Hahn. In fact, Otto, Otto Hahn was, had protested saying that, no, this is actually joint, should have been given to both Meitner and Hahn, Hahn and Meitner. At that time, at that time, at the, young, at the younger age, at Hahn was a little, I mean, I, I would say he, he was not so much, he didn't take this attitude against Meitner. Okay. But one uh, thing, one thing which happened was that all the papers had Hans' name first and Meitner's name second. Yeah. Well, that could be alphabetical. But anyway, uh, the other thing is that uh, apparently when uh, Lisa Meitner was working on uh, this and and uh, the German newspapers reported, uh, it was called cosmic physics at that time, and they wrote cosmetic physics because she was. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah like, uh, this was given, yeah, it was, our lecture uh, was con considered cosmetic physics. Yes. The, the newspaper reported. <laughs> okay. So that's the two yeah. points. I Thank, uh, thanks, Bindu. Uh, any other questions? I did see if, if somebody wants to speak. Yeah. yeah, Ajit, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, absolutely beautiful talk here. Yeah. I have a simple question. This, I mean, we sometimes talk about this um, influence of gender on nature of science we do. Uh, and I I mean, I was very uh, um, uh, really touched by this part you mentioned, the Manhattan Project. She refused to join. She was asked to refuse to join. Yes. And I'm wondering whether this gender played a role there. I mean, uh, were there other people who refused to join this project? Manhattan Project, who were asked and who refused? Mm -hmm. Pauli refused, Born refused. Ah, yeah. They were close to refuse. Okay. All right. Yeah, there were others. Others also refused. Yes, no. but you know, my, the same my, ground. She was, she was, she was. I mean, as, as her paper, of which uh, her nephew uh, written, that she was a, uh, she was a, always a human being. I mean, that that the humanity is was her first thing. Yes, yes. She has always been. Uh, she had that that prime example. Of, okay. We have two okay. more questions. Thank I think uh, Ushashi and then Shika. Yeah, yeah, I can. Okay, thank you, Amida. It was very nice and illuminated talk. So I had a really question about the uh, Nobel Committee, how they could uh, give it to uh, Han, not uh, Lise, because the explanation paper was first done by Lise, and then uh, Otto Han, they have uh, separately published. So I think Nobel Committee must give some because of the experiment they have performed, but Again, that explanation was given after hard paper. So, what was the reason they have given? Can you tell us? Well, there is no, there is no, I, I think the, <laughs> the, the archives are now open uh, of the Nobel Committee. So, one can look at, at, look at that. And there has been a lot of analyze, analysis of that as well. I mean, Ruth uh, Lime, uh, Levin Syme uh, uh, talks about it uh, in our book. Uh, the, these three books, these three things which I uh, refer to, Disney Meitner's book, uh, the uh, Ruth Lewin science book, and Patricia Rice, they, are the, they, are the, they have the maximum amount of information. And, but then there's the Memoirs of uh, Fellows of Royal Society, also is there by Robert Frisch, which was published in 1970. And then uh, several other articles. In fact, recently, the last and the 75 years of fiction, there has been an article by, uh, I forget, the two gentlemen. To German physicists, they have gone into the into the thing in detail a little more and analyze analyze the uh, the uh, Nobel Committee's things as well as the role of Hunt and so on. Uh, there they talked about this basically the Nobel Committee and his that is their view. Uh, the Nobel Committee what they could not figure out that what her contribution was in the, in the particular because the paper which. The chemistry paper, which says the barium has been, which is barium, conclusively proven, didn't have a name or their acknowledgement. 
that is the that's probably played the most most important role plus the fact that this was a as also it was a chemistry the uh, the it was a nobel prize in chemistry not in physics uh, in fact bohr had nominated her for physics prize afterwards also in, and uh, and for han in 47 he had nominated her for the physics prize himself but uh, anyway that that's uh, the what actually went into the committee decision was not known but definitely the role the play, the the uh, the, the uh, that it was quite clear that mane sigban who was the chairman of the uh, nobel physics committee for physics he had uh, uh, he didn't actually got get along very well or that never encouraged meitner's play a uh, place in the, in the Sweden, in our in his institute, so that Manu Sigman's attitude may might have also played a role. Okay, uh, we have the last question from Shikha. Uh, hello, uh, Professor Roy. Very very beautiful talk. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question was also actually connected that uh, Sigman may have been in a member for few years, but it is very shocking that she was uh, nominated uh, so many times, forty eight times, and she couldn't. Uh, make it uh, so other members also were uh, sort of uh, not in favor of her it seems like but uh, any yeah, it could be it could, it could be see the thing is again uh, act up uh, the as um, nazra bandana was saying that she uh, the, her, the perception of her being the uh, not being as no it was mentioned in the paper in the, uh, at that time all the time that she was hans assistant But this is what actually was uh, most painful to Lisa Martin, mm -hmm. that she was being referred to everywhere as Han's assistant, meet arbiter of Han, meet arbiter of Han, the assistant of Han. So this might have played the role. Yeah, the but time. but any information if at that time uh, any women were there in the in this Nobel committees or it was fully. Uh, no, no, no. That that this information would not be there. But the Nobel Committee deliberations uh, after fifty years normally they are they are made public, fifty years or uh, if years if the if the there is no survivor of the Nobel laureate. Nobel laureate. Mm -hmm. So long as a Nobel laureate mm -hmm. survives, that particular the, the deliberation cannot be made open. That is the rule. Okay. So these papers were made public in late nineties. This there yeah, is a this uh, Physics Today article by this uh, uh, Ruth Swainsheim, and then the book yes. also discusses that a lot. Right, so you right. can see the correspondence. It was just basically, I think, she was just put on the uh, sidelines, but with this argument that her role cannot be very clearly asserted. That was the yeah. perception. This is what I gather from it, which is very unfortunate. And uh, thing which of is course. completely also compounded is that like the science was her life, and as she just had to walk out of a lab, catch the train, and leave, right, leaving right. all her work behind. That's something which is mm, very, very when sad, you look yeah. at it after all the struggle coming back. That that something stays there with me. And when you yeah. read that book, I mean, that's the thing you feel that that's all hardship and. I, it's, it's really a cruel life. Uh, the life can. Yeah, I, I, I entirely agree I with agree. that. That that should not hard. And Han no knew about it. He, he knew very much about that. She has been pushed out of Germany from the lab, and still he did not include her name. Okay, as uh, Professor Roy said that probably because he was scared of himself, his own life. But he could have given the uh, acknowledgement at least in his paper. But. Well. You know, That is very. No, I think at that time, if he had put the name in the paper, his life he would have, his life would have been in danger. So that is understandable. Yeah, 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 that's, that's, that's well, I mean, I think these are now the uh, matters for the debate. Yeah, yeah. It's the only, one thing only, which we should no, but, say is that uh, which we should also note is she is the only other uh, woman than Marie Curie who has got the element named after her. And yeah. it's an interesting uh, coincidence that both of them share a birthday. They were just born hundred years apart, hundred and one years apart. Right, right. Okay. 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 No, I think I think that's that's it. I mean, yeah. Lisa might. I to for me, Lisa Meitner standing does not get diminished at all by the by not getting her Nobel. In fact, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is incidental only. I mean, it is well. We yeah. for of course always Nobel Prize is considered to be you know, the, you know, one of the highest awards that. We we can we all everybody would like to have, but then Lisa Meitner as is she 
through her struggles, through her struggles and everything, despite all that, all that effort, and and it's with the with the dedication and passion for physics, she turned out, I mean, she turned out and uh, to be something of a of a, I mean, she's a kind of role model for not just women uh, scientists, but for all, any scientist. She's a role model for anyone who aspires to be a scientist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I, I also learned a few things, Professor Ra. Thank you for your wonderful speech. I, I really learned many things I did not know of them. So it's good. So and, let uh, me I, then. I will uh, request Professor Bandana Manal to send the information a little late because I saw that it email came only by an hour before four o'clock. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I have sent the, uh, I put the link in the table. We'll send next time in advance. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. Please, so please, let please. me just thank the speaker once again. Professor, Professor thank you, Amit, for, for a really, really nice talk. And uh, we are having Pavinari lecture once a month. So we will announce next month's lecture soon. And we hope, look forward to seeing you all there. Because the lectures are held in online or hybrid mode. And thanks once again to, for the asset to host this jointly. Over to you, Satya. Uh, I thought Srirupa had a question in case just he wants Oh, to... sorry, I didn't No, no, no. I was just had a thumbs up, not a question. Yeah, okay. Oh, I sorry. Okay. <laughs> because I, saw, I just closed my... No, no, I was just appreciating the wonderful talk. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me also join uh, on behalf of uh, said uh, um, join all the all the people, all the participants, all the colleagues uh, who have said so many words. Uh, how great this talk has been! Not just only for the content and the life of such a great lady, but also the way you have brought in added a nice mix of history, the context, and of course uh, you went down to say the physics that was involved and so on. It has been a wonderful talk. We didn't even see that it was one or 45 minutes at the end of the talk uh, that we listened to and absolutely great talk, Dr. Roy. And uh, as I was saying in the beginning of uh, the colloquium, just give me a second, that uh, uh, ASET has been kind of celebrating 40 years uh, of its existence. So uh, this year we had uh, made uh, so to commemorate this uh, mementos, uh, I'm actually going to show uh, a virtual memento to you and the physical one will we'll arrive at your postal address uh, very soon. Uh, so let me uh, just show you what it looks like. Uh, so this is what it is. And uh, so of course, if you see the asset webpage, you will see the iconic uh, um, the pillar uh, in Delhi. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you very much. It looks very really nice. It looks thank great. You, yeah. Very much for all of you. Yeah, it's a great, great one. Very good one. Yeah, very nice. Sir. Thanks, all of you, uh, for participating and also bringing uh, lots of new insights into this lecture by wonderful questions and also discussion. So, we will again uh, want to have all of you on 31st um, of this month, March, uh, that is going to be in person uh, colloquium in Homi Baba Auditorium. Uh, where Dr. Samya Swaminathan, the former chief scientist of WHO, is going to talk. So all are welcome again. Of course, it's also going to be a hybrid. So some of you cannot uh, attend it physically, could again uh, participate. Yeah, please send the information in good time. Sure. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank 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 you. Thank